entertaining, informative, and educational. Inspiring content that makes a difference. This is the Maximus Choi Publications Broadcasting Network. Join the Academy. The Breeders Academy proudly presents Bread to Perfection with Kenny Troiano. A show for serious breeders. Whether you are looking to create a new strain or simply improve an old one, you have come to the right place. Daddy, I want more chicken. <laughs> oh, boy. Now, here's your host, Kitty Triano. Well, hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of Bread to Perfection. My name is Kenny Troiano, and this, my friends, is the podcast devoted to helping you become a better breeder and taking your strain to the next level. That's right, my friends. It doesn't matter if you are brand new to breeding or you've been breeding for many years. There is something all of us can do to improve our fowl for future generations. Life is like a pen of crosses. You never know what you're going to get. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Bread to Perfection. On today's episode, we will be discussing crossbreeding misconceptions. Crossbreeding is a very common method of breeding, but many are using it for the wrong reasons. The truth is, there are some unintended consequences from using this method. Many of them are long lasting and could be detrimental to the breed. In this episode, we will be discussing what's good about crossbreeding and also, what is not so good about crossbreeding. We'll tell you what others don't want you to know. Another secret is going to get out. Hopefully, this episode will change the way you look at crossbreeding and change the way you breed your fowl. I really think this is an episode that's going to be good for my members and non-members. This is something that I think everybody should listen to. Okay, we're going to get into the show, but we will be right back after a quick word from the Breeders' Academy. So stay tuned. This show was brought to you by the Breeders Academy, where we will help you to increase your knowledge of breeding, advance your skills as a breeder, and help you to improve the quality and performance of your fowl. As a member, we'll provide you with the roadmap that you will need to create a true family or strain. I urge you to check it out. You've got nothing to lose and you can cancel at any time. You also have a 30-day money-back guarantee. Simply go to www.breedersacademy.com to sign up. The Breeders Academy will not only change the way you think about breeding, but improve the way you breed your fowl. I hope to see you there. So let's get started. We're back. Crossbreeding misconceptions, and I'm telling you, there's a lot of them. The difference between hybridization and mongrelization. Did I say it right? I wasn't listening. <laughs> I'm actually thinking about what I'm going to say here. Oh my um, gosh. Just so you know, for the members of the Breeders Academy, make sure you check out the programs and courses inside the website, especially the ones on the practice of crossbreeding the practice of infusion, and the practice of outcrossing. Those particular programs, we go more in depth. We try to cover as much as we can inside the show, but there's no way we cover everything. So along with this show, make sure to check out those programs and courses. Also, make sure that you check out episode 12, the podcast show, episode 12. It's Pure Versus Crosses. This is one of my favorite episodes because I really pick Kenny's brain on this one. I'm surprised I'm still living right now <laughs> after that episode. But before we get started, Kenny, didn't you do a poll on the crossbreeding subject? Well, that's what I've been doing a lot lately is going on Facebook. Whatever subject we plan on either covering on the podcast or on the live show, 
and then going on Facebook and doing a poll. Just kind of get some feedback from our followers on what they're thinking and what they do and what they practice. Then we could feed off of it. And so I did one that said, are you interested in creating a strain or a signature line? Or are you interested in only crossbreeding and infusion? And it was interesting numbers because creating a strain was 391 votes. Crossbreeding was 72 and infusion was 39. And this is really encouraging to me because there was a lot more, probably three or four times more, well, actually good four times more people saying that they're interested in creating a strain. But years ago, I never saw that. Not too many people were actually interested in creating a strain for various reasons. And in the 72, I expected to see some for sure. But the 72, I kind of wonder why those people are even on my Facebook page. This is not something I normally teach. Matter of fact, we're going to be tackling this subject in a very interesting way. For instance, we're calling this thing crossbreeding misconceptions, because I think there's a lot of things about crossbreeding that people don't understand. And so I'm not going to be really talking for it exactly. I'm not trying to shoot it down exactly, but I want people to understand what crossbreeding really means and what they should expect. Well, I understand why the people that want to learn more about crossbreeding and infusion why they are still there listening to you. It's because they're the smart ones who want to know how to crossbreed without messing up their bloodlines. Yeah. That's how I see it. Yeah. So today we're going to address that. We're going to address the beliefs around crossbreeding and infusion. What I've noticed through the years is the amount of people that are interested in constantly adding outside blood. They're always crossing two unrelated birds with contrasting characteristics and thinking they can achieve the best from both worlds. Or infusing new blood, they believe they can fix a fault by infusing new blood. So if they run into a problem with their birds, they just add someone else's bird into it or add some blood into it and think that they can fix it. They believe that the only way to improve a family is by breeding in new blood. Or that they they believe in adding new blood, they're freshening the strain. And what's scary about this is that they think that they can add this kind of blood and then breed it back out. So they breed in, let's say they got a family, it seems like it has some faults, so they add some blood, and then they think they can breed it back out. It doesn't work like that. And I'm hoping in this podcast that we can explain to you why that's not true. Well, hold on, I'm a little bit confused here. Aren't crossbreeding and infusion the same action? In some ways it is. If I'm trying, well, let's put it this way. I think it's thought differently depending on the person. So if I'm crossbreeding, if I'm looking to produce a certain bird for performance or production, I'm usually going to get two birds to breed them together and get hybrid vigor. And I'm going to produce some specimens that are going to do a particular job. And this is with all animals. It's not just with chickens. It's not just with game fowl, but all animals. Now, infusion is basically crossbreeding when you think about it, because you're adding new blood. But the fact that they're breeding in new blood thinking that they're adding genes that they think their birds don't have, and then they actually breed it out by like a 1 16th infusion method. Well, the problem is it doesn't work like they think it does. When you add new blood, you're adding a lot of faults. You're adding a lot of new genes. You're adding a lot of recessives. Crossing, if you do it right, you're doing your cross. You're producing birds for the purpose for which they were bred. You shouldn't be breeding them after that point. Those birds have a specific purpose. That's it. They're not part of your breeding program, but infusion, it's the other way around. You're actually breeding something in, and then you're breeding your birds into the offspring each year, thinking that you're breeding it out and you're not. So it is crossbreeding, you're right, but the goal is different. Crossbreeding and infusion are two different goals, but they just don't work like they think they do. Well, crossbreeding does work if you do it right. Infusion, for the purpose of what they think they're trying to accomplish, no. No. Now, if you're creating a strain and you got a subline and you're doing an infusion for experiment or you're trying to improve your line somehow, but you're not trying to impact your foundation, at least not in the start, then infusion is, there's a purpose for it. But you have to know what you're doing. Within the family. Within the family. Not bringing no. outside blood. No, Infusion is adding outside blood, but you're doing it with a subline. This is the way you should be doing it. You're doing it with the subline. You're not doing it with your foundation line. Whether that line turns out like you hoped is another thing. Is it something that will end up being put into the foundation down the road, like five or six years down the road? That's another thing. Now, if you have one family, one line, and you're using infusion, 
and you're not doing the subline, you're just adding it right into your foundation, 99% of the time you've made a mistake. So that's a good question, actually, is it is the same, but for a different purpose. No, I think you explained it pretty good. Okay, yeah. Okay, let me ask you this. You want to infuse some new blood to help your bloodlines, but you create your subline because you don't put it right into your main line. You create your subline and you bring in this new bird to correct something and it ends up correcting it. Now, if you take that offspring from that subline and put it into your main line, aren't you still re- recombinating? recombinating the genes? That's a good question. When you're infusing new blood, even if you're doing it right by using a subline, you're not going to accomplish your goals in one or two matings or one or two generations. Any family, even if infusion is going to take, I would say, five or six years to really iron that thing out, to breed it the way you need to breed it before you add it into a, a foundation or before it becomes a foundation. So just know, just because you create a subline and you didn't breed that infusion, you didn't breed that bird, that new outside bird, into your foundation line right away, even though you create a subline, it's going to take quite a few years to figure out whether that infusion was a a mating in the right direction. Does that make sense? It does, but I would still be afraid to incorporate those offspring after like five or six years, that offspring into your main bloodline. What I'll say here is this. If you're creating a strain or improving a strain, whether using a foundation line or a subline, you would start, you'd be using the founders program, my breeding program. Now, I can't talk about the in and outs of that. I can't talk about the sequence of that right now. That's for the members inside the Breeders Academy. But if you really want to understand how to create a strain, maintain a strain, or improve a strain, or whether you want to improve a foundation line or create a new subline that will hopefully someday become a foundation line, then you got to get to know the founders program. Does it end up becoming its own foundation line or does it go into the foundation line that you already have? Both. It can become its own foundation line if you do it right. That's what we teach with the Founders Program. Or it can be later down the road, it could be infused into the foundation line. But you're not going to know whether that's a safe infusion into the foundation line for a good five or six years, to be honest with you. If you do the Founders Program right. I don't know if it were me. I don't think I would... I'd keep it as a subline and make its own foundation line. It may even be, Nessie, if you do it right, it may turn out to be better than the foundation line. And you you may actually abandon the foundation line and this one becomes the new foundation line. That can happen. That can happen too. That can happen. But if you follow the founders program, it's going to show you how to do that right. So it's a good question, just not one I can answer here. Yeah, okay. Yeah. You know, when we're talking about crossbreeding and infusion... And the trends that we see within breeders, whether it's domestic chickens or game fowl, and I do see it a lot in game fowl. There's a quote that Herbert Atkinson wrote back in the early 1900s that I think is uh, pertinent. It goes like this. I've seen many of the best and most valued of old strains lost entirely by the falling into the hands of unskillful breeders or those who have the propensity for constantly crossing with fresh blood or a desire for something new and striving after perfection which was more certainly obtained by mating and breeding a known breed in its purity with right selection than by introducing fresh blood. However good with its uncertainties and the certainty of throwbacks to faults and weaknesses long since bred out in both strains, appearing in the fresh cross by Herbert Atkinson. Now, you, what you can see from this is that things really haven't changed. And this was back in the 19, early 1900s, and we're still dealing with this today. So what we're seeing is people are crossbreeding, but they're overusing it. They misunderstand the results they should be getting, and they're misunderstanding the consequences of doing it wrong. Now, what I take from that is unskillful breeders, constantly crossing with fresh blood, desiring something new, striving for perfection. It Uh, sounds like an oxymoron. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) Purity in the right selection, introducing new blood uncertainties, throwbacks to faults and weaknesses long since bred out. See, those weaknesses and throwbacks were bred out and then they were just brought right back in. Yeah. I see, that's what I take from what he just said. The words he uses are very specific when you think about it. In this small paragraph, he says a lot. And I wanted to make sure everybody understood that. And I know that something they've been fighting since way before us 
what we're still dealing with today. But I actually think the birds today are a lot worse than they were back then. Even when I was a kid, when I would see them, they were in much better shape. And even then they needed some work. But with everybody adding acils and Peruvian fowl into them, the breed's actually changing. And that's everything we can do with the Breeders Academy and the Founders Program to try to get this breed back on track. And that's been my goal all along is preservation. For those who do not know who Herbert Atkinson was, can you just tell them a little bit about him? I want to do a, a bio on him in the website. But basically, he was the uh, president of the Old Oxford Old English Club. And there's some history to attach to this, too, because back in the late 1800s, they had outlawed cockfighting. And so what happened was all the cockfighters either quit or went underground. And then the ones that were above ground, it was around the same time they started doing poultry shows, between the exhibitors who didn't really understand the breed and the judges, within about 40 years, they basically changed the old English game into what we now know as the modern game, which is a completely different bird. If it wasn't for Herbert Atkinson and his followers, we would have lost the old English game. They brought them out from the shadows and restored them. And we're kind of seeing that. And what's, what's striking is if it wasn't for that, we wouldn't have the American games we have today. Our American games have a lot of Old English in them. They have Irish in them. They do have the ACIL, the Spanish, and some other birds. So they are quite different. But if it wasn't for the Old English, we wouldn't have the birds we have today. So it's really important that happened. But what's happening now, the American games, they did take on a shape that made them very unique, but really nice bird. Well, now we're starting to change them. We haven't learned our lesson. We're starting to go right back into what was happening back in the uh, late 1800s and early 1900s. We're changing the American games and not in a good direction either. And you know why that is? I'm going to tell you why that is. Because people are impatient. Yeah, and I think you're right too. But I also think they don't have the knowledge. They don't understand the breed. They don't understand the history of the breed. They don't understand the makeup of the breed. They don't understand why the breed is built the way they are. They, they were selectively bred the way they are for a reason. Well, people have this idea that I'm going to add a sill in it because it gives it a certain attribute that's far from what represents a breed. They're going to add the Peruvian because it gives it a higher station or something like that. I wish I would have that quote in front of me too because Herbert Atkinson made it very clear that we shouldn't change the breed. We should be happy with the way they are and maintain them for what they are. And I'm just paraphrasing, but that's not what we're doing. People are actually trying to change them. And there's no devotion or loyalty to the breed itself. It's almost like they don't even care that they're American games. They don't even care. They just know that they're game fowl. And they think that by adding this bird into them, they're changing them for the better, which they really aren't because whatever they're changing is short-lived. So they either keep on breeding in new blood or they get rid of them and start all over with something else and then do it all over again. Right, where in the long run, that could be very expensive because if you're constantly buying new birds to cross over with what you've got... It's a hamster wheel that you'll never get off. It does make me feel good because the breeders inside the Breeders Academy are motivated, excited. They're really interested in creating their own strains. They're interested in maintaining the breed and they're interested in breeding birds that represent their breed. And that's what makes me feel good. That's what gives me hope from what I'm seeing inside the Breeders Academy. Not what I'm seeing on Facebook or other places. I know. It's been your long time goal. Your life's work is to reach that goal where you can penetrate as many breeders as possible and set them in the right direction. Yep. The only way to do that is one person at a time. Well, I like to do it more than that, but (laughs) you know what I mean. Well, we got hundreds of members inside the Breeders Academy, so I'm Hundreds of members at a time. How's that? Yeah, okay, there you go. (laughs) (laughs) Sounds more hopeful. Uh Speaking of crossbreeding, what is one of the questions that you see most when somebody like wants to crossbreed? People will contact me, and the one that sticks in my mind the most, and it's related to crossbreeding, is what are the best crosses? This kind of shows you where we're at today because they're kind of stuck on the name game. Okay, they don't really understand how it all works. So they'll go, would you breed like a hatch to a Kelso or a roundhead to a sweater or something like that? And they're kind of shocked at my answer. You burst their bubble. I do. I burst their bubble big time. You know, these breeders don't understand that these so-called names that they're attaching to them, first of all, they don't exist. None of them are pure and all of them are already crosses. And I would venture to say that a lot of them are mongrels on top of that. 
and we'll describe what's the difference between a simple hybrid cross and a mongrel. But uh, yeah, that's the question I get, and it's the one that makes me just, I can feel my body drain when they ask me that. But first of all, they're not going to like my answer. It's going to confuse them because they've been told all along that some of the best birds out there are like hatch, things like that. So. Yeah, yeah, and I'm going to interrupt you here because I just got to say this. You shouldn't be like, oh, God. You should be like, ooh, goody, because now... No, because you don't want to... Wait, because now you've got them. There's another one that you can sway over to the good side. You know, side. it's harder than you think because they are so stuck on their paradigms. They're so stuck on these ideas. When you cross that idea or you say something that's contrary to what they believe or what they understand, it's almost like they shut down and they just don't understand because they've been told for so long. Some believing things like anything crossed with hatch is good or all crosses are good if they have hatch bred into them. Or one I've heard recently quite a bit lately is Albanese fix everything. This is nonsense. This is nothing but nonsense. And if they could understand that, they would make more progress and have more fun with it. I, I mean, I sound like a broken record, but those are the people that really do need to join the Breeders Academy so we can show them how it really works and why those names really do mean nothing. There's a whole different approach they need to take than what they're doing right now. Well, that's what I'm saying. They wouldn't come to you and ask you that question if they didn't respect the answer that you're going to give them. That's number one. So number two, you take that as, okay, he's coming to me for advice. So great. Here's my chance to teach him and direct him into the oh, right, I do. right direction. I do. I'm not going to just hang the phone up on him or not answer him. <laughs> But, you say, no, dummy, you although, can't do that. <laughs> although I don't really answer the phone much these days, and I spend very little time on Facebook and everything. At this time, I would say 99% of my time is on the Breeders Academy. If they want to talk to me, they want to learn from me, that's where they need to go. Now, sometimes they will get a hold of me on the live show. But to be honest with you, we get so caught up in what we're talking about. There's a lot of times there's comments and questions, and we never get around to getting to them because we're so busy talking in teaching our topic and trying to make sure we cover the information we want to cover, that every time I glance over at the comments, I'm either too involved in the conversation that we're already having, or the comments that they're making aren't relative to what we're talking about at the time. So they end up getting passed by. Well, you're trying to stay on topic, but you do answer questions. I try to. That And there's a lot of good questions. Yeah, we do like for the listeners to stay on topic so that we can really get in depth into what we're talking about. So they got to understand that they're probably not going to get the answers that they're looking for when they want to talk to me about crossbreeding and they start mentioning names because those strains just don't exist. And the truth is, if someone's telling you as a blanket statement that you're going to get this from a hatch or this is how to breed a hatch, then it's a false statement, Okay. If I were to make that same statement to everyone who asked me that, I can guarantee you that everyone, let's say 100 people ask me that, every one of those are going to have a different result. They're not going to have the same result as the other person because those birds are not pure hatch. They have a lot of crosses. I would venture to say, once again, that there's some mongrel blood, meaning that there's multiple bloodlines in there. They can call it hatch all they want, but I guarantee you that name doesn't exist anymore and that they're not going to get the same results as everybody else. So that shows you that we shouldn't be following those names. I know why, but explain yourself a little bit here. The reason why the hatch no longer exists, it's because the breeder okay, okay, no good. longer exists. The breeder was Sandy Hatch back in the 40s or 50s, around that time. Now, everything that left his farm, they called Hatch. Him and Kelso, Walter Kelso, were constantly exchanging blood all the time. And I'm sure they were getting birds from other people too. So I've never seen any evidence that Walter Kelso, Sandy Hatch, or any of those others actually created a strain where they never added outside blood into them. They were always adding outside blood. Now, like I said, anything that left their farm was automatically called Hatch. So they never were a set family in the first place. And then when people get them and they're doing this today, let's say I have a Hatch and I sell someone, I say it's a Hatch. Well, I can guarantee you the first thing he's going to do is just add whatever he has into them. And the offspring, he's still going to call hatch, even though they're not hatch. And then he'll sell those birds to somebody else, and then they'll add new blood into them. So it's really insane that we're following this trend. 
But I've also heard you say about Johnny Jumper, you can tell a Johnny Jumper bird anywhere. That's true. And I'll tell you what I think about that. Now, a lot of people ask me what I think of Johnny Jumper's birds. They're not for me. But I think Johnny Jumper was a good enough breeder that he bred a family that I can tell when I go on someone's farm, I know the family well enough. I would say to them, that looks like a Johnny Jumper family because they look identical. And he'd say, that's who I got them from directly. The only time I wasn't able to do that is when they added new blood. They got birds from Johnny Jumper and added new blood. I do think he's a good breeder. His family are very uniform and consistent, and the offspring are very predictable. It's just that they're just not for me. They're not my type of bird. But I do think he's a good breeder, and I think the birds were a true family. But that needs to be your goal, your end result, is that you can go on somebody's farm and you can tell right off the bat, that's so-and-so's bird, like your Maximus line. Yeah. You can go on somebody's farm who have bought a Maximus cocker hen from you and they can go, "Mm -hmm, yep, I know who that bird belongs to. Yeah. That is why I'm speaking to the breeders today. And I'm telling you, that is what your goal should be, is that you become one of those breeders where somebody can go on somebody else's farm that you have sold your bird to And they can pick it out and go, oh, yeah, I know whose bird that is. To me, it's a feather in my cap. I am so proud and happy that I have the strain that I have, that I created my own strain. I wouldn't find that kind of satisfaction by just getting new birds all the time and crossing them and experimenting. And if I didn't understand the genetics, I wouldn't be able to tell what the offspring are telling me. And I wouldn't be able to do much with them. You're interested in bringing new blood all the time and crossing them and just seeing what you get? The results are going to be a little confusing because if you don't understand the genetics, you're going to be working against yourself instead of actually accomplishing something. It could be as boring as doing laundry. I think so too. (laughs) Because you're not progressing. You don't see any progression. All is frustration. Yeah. So we talked about the name game, but I do believe the name game and crossbreeding go hand in hand. And what's sad about it is it has become the peddler's playground. So without those names... I'm convinced that if they didn't have those names to play with, the peddlers wouldn't exist because that's the only way they do exist is by breeding whatever they can get their hands on. Whatever they look like is what they call them. And because those names are important, people buy them. And it's only because of the names that people do buy them. We did an episode on the live show. It was episode 36 and it was called The Name Game and the Mongolization of a Breed. So I encourage you to check that out because we went pretty deep into the idea of the name game. And I think we covered it in a way that uh, you're going to understand why it's not a good idea, that we need to get away from it. And what I've noticed too is if you get around like game fowl breeders, for one, you get to talking. If you were to take away the name game and the idea of crossing, they wouldn't have anything to talk about. It's all about the names. It's all about the different crosses. But at the same time, it's like you go on their farm and that's all they talk about is crossing and the names, the different names they have. It sounds like or or looks like they have like 20 or 30 different birds, but yet they'll also say that they have a signature line. They'll have a signature line, but all they talk about is crossing and crosses. To me, that's a red flag that we need to pay attention to. They got little feathers in their caps, but it's like, oh, I got a line of hatch and I got a line of Kelso and all this. They're claiming they have pure lines and they have their own signature line, but when you pay attention All they ever talk about is the name game and crosses. I have this bird. It's a hatch crossed to a Kelso. I have this bird. It's a round head crossed to a sweater. You never see the pure birds. You never see their actual lines. That's all they ever talk about is these crosses and the different names they have. But when they start to brag, they're talking about their signature lines. I just think that's a big red flag. Well, you know what I see? Defect, (laughs) call, and... Mongrel, (laughs) girl. Yeah, and frustration. And and the breeder going, yeah, I've been trying to get this out of it, but I I hatched these chicks and I I couldn't believe what this came out of these parents. Frustration. So this reminds me of a podcast show that I just recently edited. Now, his name was Juan, and Juan had gone down to Mexico to visit his family. And while he was down there, he helped his uncle work on his farm with his game fowl. So he really got interested in game fowl. He loved it. So he was like instantly hooked. So he comes back to America and he's like, okay, I'm all in. So he Googles everything. He's Googling on how to raise game fowl. He's watching all these videos. He's pulling videos from this and that, just everywhere that he can get. He just wants all this knowledge and information so he can learn everything. Well, 
Through him searching out all these videos, he found us. And he really liked what he saw when he was watching our videos and he was listening to our podcast. And he's like, and these guys seem like they kind of know what they're talking about. So he actually became a Breeders Academy member. And, you know, at this point, he didn't have any game foul yet, but he was smart because he wanted to go in there and learn everything he could about game foul before he actually started his breeding program. He wanted to learn everything about how to choose or how to select brood fowl before he went out and bought them so that he wasn't wasting money, which I think is really smart that he did that. So is there a moral to this story? <laughs> yes, there's a moral to the story. So you need to be patient. So yes, Juan goes through the Breeders Academy, watches all the videos, reads all the articles and really digs in and he's gaining a lot of knowledge. And then he starts talking to his dad and his uncle about all the things that he's learned on the Breeders Academy. And his uncles are like, Nah, I don't know. I've been breeding for years is the way I breed and I'm not going to change things now. And I don't know about that. Right. So one in the coaching call with Kenny, he's saying, you know what? I know what my brood fowl is going to be now because I've studied it in the Breeders Academy and I'm going to get myself some awesome birds and I'm going to start my breeding program because I'm going to follow the founders program and I'm going to go back in like three, five years from now, I'm going to show up with these birds and I'm going to go, see, see, look what I got. Look what you have. Look what I got. I would coal, coal, coal all these birds you got in your farm, but look what I've got. So the moral to the story is I love these stories because for one, he is going to have nothing but success because he's doing the studying that he needs to do. And two, he's out there and he's going to show these people that are stuck in their old mindset about how to breed. And hopefully through proof in the pudding, he's going to change these guys' minds. Yeah, because the information in the Breeders Academy and the Founders Program, it makes so much sense. It's it almost common sense. I've had members say, it's common sense, but it's funny. You almost wouldn't think of it unless you've seen it for yourself because without it, you just wouldn't think about it. Because basically the old wives tells that they've been hearing all this time is so ingrained in their mind, the common sense part of it gets blocked out. And so when they see how the founders program is laid out, it's like an aha moment. They're like, why didn't I think of that? Of course it's common sense. So that's the sense you're feeling from him. That that's the motivation he has because it's almost like he's seen the light. And I think he's fighting his uncle and his dad so much because they haven't seen what he has seen. They've been doing it for so long this way. They didn't know there was another way. And so when Juan comes and tells them what he's seen and what he's learning, they just can't grasp it. They can't understand it. But I told him, I go, just keep telling them, just keep showing them. I think eventually they're going to think about what you're saying and they're going to start putting two and two together and go, yeah, okay, that makes sense. And then they're going to try it and they're going to see the results and they're going to start little by little changing their ways. Are they going to stop everything they were doing and start something new? Chances are no. Now, if they got into the Breeders Academy and the Founders Program and saw how that website was laid out and the information that's there and saw how the Founders Program was laid out, they would probably sit down and think, oh, wow, I never thought of that. It just makes so much sense. But that's what I tell everybody is get in there. Get into the, the Breeders Academy. Become a member for a while. Check it out, okay? You can always quit anytime. And if you quit within the first 30 days, I give your money back. I think you're going to be really impressed. If you're interested in breeding at all, the Breeders Academy is where you want to be. There's nobody teaching this information out there. Nobody. And the ones that have tried have failed because they don't really understand it themselves. And they're always missing some key elements that need to be there. And there's a couple, we call them secrets. They're not really secrets. But there's a couple things about the Founders Program that make it all work. And it's the same two things that everybody is missing. Which you're not going to know unless you you're join. in the Breeders you Academy. Join. Yeah, I'm, uh, you just do. You yeah. got to try it. Well, I'm telling you, I just thank God every day for people like Juan. Because it's like what I said earlier, Changing people's mind one at a time. Yeah, I know you like to say thousands at a time or hundreds, hundreds at, at least a time. Hundreds at a time. Hundreds at uh -huh. a time. He's setting the example. And I love that about him. And I love that he is so hungry for this information. And he's going to do really well. And he's going to set the example for other people to see. We have hundreds like him. He's just the example that we're using right now. But we have hundreds just like him. Yes, we do. 
He's front and center right now because I just edited his He represents all our members. He does. He does. He's a sweetie, though. Okay. One of the things I noticed, too, that's getting people tied up in knots is something I call the percentage game. I hear this all the time. My bird has three-quarter of this and a quarter of that. Three-quarters hatch and a quarter sweater. And they play this percentage game like it means something. The question is, what are they missing when they think like this? What they're trying to do is they're trying to connect genetic inheritance with mathematics. And it doesn't work like that. The bird is made up of genes, which represent traits. Those same traits are shared by all the different bloodlines. These genes don't follow fractions or mathematics. And a good example of this would be like the comb. Now, a comb is a comb. You see the same type of comb in a hat. You see the same type of comb in a sweater. You see the same type of comb in the Kelso. I'm just naming some off right now. What we're looking at is genes. And a gene is a gene. A gene represents a trait. You cannot link those traits to a specific breed or a specific family or a specific strain. It just doesn't work like that. So you got to understand that there's no such thing as half or quarter of a trait. They either have it or they don't. Some traits, such as polygenic traits, have different intensities, but not different percentages. And we need to get away from that percentage game. It's tying people in knots. It's not true. It doesn't exist. And they think by taking something they think is a hatch and breeding it to a sweater that they got half and half. Okay, then they add a round head to it. Now they think they have a quarter hatch, quarter sweater, and then half round head. No, they have a collection of genes. And those genes represent traits. And those traits are shared by all breeds and strains. The only difference is some are dominant, some are recessive. If they have the dominant trait, they have to express it. If they're expressing it, you just don't know if it's pure. If they're expressing a recessive trait, it's pure for that trait. But you can't link those traits to a specific family. It doesn't work like that. And this is also true with production performance ability, because those are polygenic traits. And the only difference between one breed and another is the intensity. And you'll never gain that trait by one infusion. You'll never gain it by crossing birds. It doesn't work like that. The only way to get traits that are polygenic, such as production or performance ability, is by constantly breeding to the highest intensity birds on your farm and thereby improving it over time. It's the only way. So until people understand that, they're wasting their time. Would you say that peddlers use crossbreeding a lot? Yeah, they use it because they think they get quicker results. In what ways? Because they're crossing, they're getting hybrid vigor. And because of hybrid vigor, the fowl are visually better. And because they do that and they're seeing quick results, they don't need to spend a lot of years to create the birds that they're trying to create, which they don't really care if the birds are actually good or not. They're just worried about whether they'll sell. So they breed, they cross birds, they take the ones that are the standouts or what we would call standouts. They ask more money for them. Everything else, they sell real cheap. What they're selling actually is an illusion. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's all fake. This whole name game, this percentage game, it's a con. It's like the big con that everybody's playing on each other and themselves. They know it's not true. The people buying birds from them know it's not true. Okay. And they know that it's not true, but they keep playing the game. Everybody knows, or most people know, that these names don't really mean much. They also know that everybody's crossed everything into them. They also know that the percentage of them really doesn't mean anything either because of all the blood that's been put into them. So basically, they're mongrels, okay? And they're playing the con on themselves and each other. Yeah, but do they really? The ones that don't know are the ones that are the newest beginners who are just getting into it and believing what they see. But I'm telling you, after a number of years of doing it and watching how everything goes, they know it too. They know how to trick. They know that it's a big con, that none of this exists, that these names mean nothing and these percentages mean nothing. Yikes. But they're convincing themselves because it's the only way they know how to do it. That's the only way they know how to move forward. It's the only way they know how to communicate with each other. But down deep, they know it's untrue. It doesn't exist. So you're saying because this is their bread and butter, this is why modern breeders today rely on crossbreeding. Basically, is that what you're saying? Because they're convinced that inbreeding is worse. They're convinced that there's no such thing as pure. They're convinced that they cannot breed a strain from this. And that's what we teach at the Breeders Academy with the Founders Program. It's actually true that you can. By taking a cock and a hen, 
It doesn't matter what they are. And then working through the founders program and creating a strain from that. And through selective breeding them and following the program, in time, you'll have a strain. They could be lacking the confidence to do it. They could not be understanding actually how to create a strain and how to maintain it. All through just keeping your lines pure and not yeah, incorporating and they, anything else It's just else simpler in for it. them to keep bringing in new blood because they see some results right away. Then it fizzles out. They become nothing. They try bringing in new blood. They hope they get a little result. Sometimes they don't. When they don't, they finally realize that they're not going anywhere. They get rid of the whole family and they start over and they do the whole thing again. Instead of buckling down and taking the best birds they have and creating a strain from that. Patience is not their virtue and performance is everything to them. And performance is very short-lived. It's very temporary, the way they're doing it. Because they're not selectively breeding for it and creating a family and then improving those traits as they go. So what they're doing is they're bringing in new blood. They get some that seem to have the performance ability they like, but it's very short-lived because they can't reproduce it. So what actually happens is performance overrides type and confirmation. Confirmation equals form, form equals function, function equals purpose. That's true, but they don't look at it that way. They think that performance is everything, but when they don't breed for confirmation, eventually the birds aren't able to perform the purpose for which they were bred, and that's when they get rid of them instead of breeding for the complete package. It's a treadmill. It's, a, it's like a hamster wheel that they never get yeah, off of. That's a good analogy of that. <laughs> well, here's another question on crossbreeding that I see you get all the time. Aren't all breeds and strains created from crosses or can hybrid crosses be used to see fell? Yeah, I think that's where most people are because very few are able to go to a breeder, even a well-established breeder, and get a pure cock and hen, a breeding pair or a trio. It's just really tough. So I would say 99% of the people who are starting out, they're starting with crosses, mixed birds. They're starting out with uh, unrelated birds. And that's exactly what the Founders Program was created for taking birds that are unrelated, taking birds that are crosses, taking birds that are even mongrels and creating family from that. Okay, that's exactly what it's created for. So the idea is to use a proper breeding program, which is usually methods in a systematic order that creates the program. Now, some people rely on one method or two methods, and they think that's the program. Well, when you look at the founder program, you're going to see what I'm talking about, that it's a multitude of methods used in the, at the right time for the right length of time to create a specific function. So you want a program that promotes progress and the fixation of traits. I don't want to get into the exact meaning of that. They'll find it out when they get into the Breeders Academy, but the fixating the traits having a fixation of traits, achieving that is the only way you're going to be able to move forward. So what you're saying is crossbreeding is a tool. It's not a breeding method. Well, there are breeding methods and there are certain methods that I do consider tools. And I do think crossbreeding is a tool because it only has one purpose, and that's to produce hybrid crosses for a specific job, whether it's production or performance or whatever it is. And because it's a cross, most of the time, especially when you're talking about crosses from two foundation lines, that's as far as it should ever go. Those crosses should never be bred. Like I said, you can create a strain from crosses because that's all you have. And if you run it through a proper program, that can be accomplished. But in general, you wouldn't have two foundation lines, cross them, and then breed to the crosses. That would be a big mistake. So what you want to do is you want to tighten the gene pool and you want to lessen genetic diversity and you want as much progress as possible. And it takes a breeding program to do that. So what you were asking, like, can you create a strain from crosses? One of the things I would say, if you can't get a cock and hen that are related, and they are either cross or they're mongrels in themselves, it's best to try to find a cock and hen that share as many of the common traits as possible. That way you're not going to fight a lot of that genetic diversity because they basically share the same traits. We're talking about comb type. We're talking about feather color. We're talking about conformation of body. We're talking about station. We're talking about leg color. All the finer points, all the parts that represent the breed. So if the two birds represent the breed, they share a lot of the common traits, you're going to make a lot more progress. Your results are going to be better and you're going to get to where you want to go faster. So that would be my suggestion is to make sure that the birds match each other as much as possible. Yeah, because it's not likely that you're going to be able to find no, I can't say that. There are breeders out there that believe in pure strains. 
Some. So they're, well, they're, they're, they are in my Breeders' Academy. I know that. There's a ton you know? of them in our Breeders' Academy. <laughs> yeah. And I know Frank has fabulous birds. Mm -hmm. But it is kind of hard to find, if you're going out, you're looking for your seed fowl, it's hard to find a pure strain that you can select from. It is hard. And that's why the Founders Program is what it is. And that's why we developed it, because of where we are at. It's going to be really tough to create a family when you're dealing with birds that have contrasting characteristics. So you have one bird with a pea comb, the other one is a straight comb. You have one that's a gray, one's a red. You got one's ACIL and you got one that's American game. We can go on and on the different traits that they either share or are opposite of each other. But it's better to pick mates that, that share as many common traits as possible and try to stay away from birds that have contrasting characteristics because it's just going to slow you down. I'm not going to say you won't get what you want, but it's going to take a lot longer. Here's something to consider too. Crossbreeding in general. Normally, crossbreeding would be like American game to an ACIL. That would be crossbreeding. That's crossing breeds. When you're dealing with birds from the same breed, but different strains or different varieties, then we're talking about an outcross. And the whole idea of crossing, we say it all the time, that you want to produce hybrid crosses. That's the whole idea for better performance, better production. But the truth is, we're looking for offspring that are superior to their parents for the specific purpose or function for which they're bred. So I think you're going to get better hybrid vigor if you do like the crossing of breeds, like a hatch to an ACIL. But like I was saying earlier, they're not well, meant to well, be bred. Well, wait a minute. You just said you're going to get a better deal if you breed, say, a hatch to an ACIL. Or a if hatch. you're looking to cross... If you're actually looking to cross, if the crossing is your goal and you're looking to produce offspring for a specific performance or production, then you're better off making sure that you're breeding one breed to another. Now, if you're breeding a strain, like a hatch to a sweater or a Kelso to a roundhead, those are all American games. That's not a cross exactly. That's an outcross. That's actually a little different. You're not going to get the true hybrid vigor that you would get if you bred two different breeds together. You see what I'm saying? So what you're saying is if your goal is to get a hybrid, then the best way to do that is to breed two different breeds breeds into one. Yeah. And the offspring will be probably your best hybrids. Yeah. Okay. You'll see the most hybrid vigor out of them. For okay. Sure. Now that makes sense to me. Yeah. Have we talked about hybrid vigor yet? Okay. So let's talk a little bit about hybrid vigor then. It's considered heterosis. People think that you can reproduce it. Actually... It only works one time. If I breed my Maximus line to an ACIL, the offspring are going to be hybrid crosses. They're going to be bigger, better, faster, stronger, smarter, all of it. They're going to have better production, better performance than their parents. That's what we hope for. That's what you hope for, but you're also going to get crap too. But it only works one time. You can't keep breeding those hybrids and thinking that you're going to improve from there. It's a one-time deal. So that's where it ends. That's the good thing about hybrid vigor and the bad thing that it's meant to do one purpose, to create the hybrid crosses, the performers that you're looking for, but it should end there. Well, how do you create mongrels then? Not that you would really want to create mongrels on purpose, but how do you do that? By continuously crossbreeding or infusion. You're always adding new blood. A simple way of describing this, let's say you, you are dealing with two pure families and you cross them. That would be a simple hybrid cross. Anytime you start moving past that, you're doing like a three-way cross or four-way cross, you've now moved into mongrelization. Those offspring are now mongrels. Anytime you have more than two bloodlines in there, it went from hybridization to mongrelization. And I know some people really hate that word mongrels, but that's what it is. It's the definition, multiple bloodlines. The offspring that are produced from multiple bloodlines are mongrels. If you don't like it, then don't do it. <laughs> you know? Well, it sounds like you're creating a mutt. Yeah, you, you know? really are. You really are yeah. because they're not anything. They don't represent the strain that they've been labeled. They no longer represent their breed at all. They're just game fowl. They have so many different bloodlines in them. They're not hybrid crosses anymore. And now they're mongrels. I'm not saying that's exactly bad. And I am saying you can create a family from that. You just got to find the right birds that represent their breed and have all the traits you're looking for. Those become your seed fowl. That's why I cringe when people talk about three and four-way crosses. I was just going to get to that. The three-way crosses and a four-way crosses. I'm thinking that people are thinking, 
yeah, I'm getting more from this guy and more from that guy. I'm going to get all this stuff from both sides and I'm going to put them all together and I'm going to have just a Super bird. big bouquet yeah. of genes that are just going to be great. Yeah, they're thinking I'm going to get a bird from this person. I'm going to put it into my blood. So why do they think that? Because they just don't know better? Nancy, it's the paradigm. It's what they've been told by other people because that's what they were doing. No one's ever had any good direction when it comes to breeding, so they think adding new blood all the time is normal. I hear it all the time. People go, oh, my strain's pure. My birds have been pure for like 30 years. I only add new blood to freshen them up every five or six years. The minute they did that, they changed the family. They recombinate the genes. And we'll talk about that more in a second. I'm actually excited to get into that part of well, it. I think the bottom line really is that they just do not understand genetics. They don't understand the impact and the consequences of crossing. They definitely don't understand genetics. Although genetics are even more important when you're doing crosses rather oh, yeah. than you're doing a family or foundation because there's more contrasting characteristics. So genetics even becomes more important. When you have a, a true foundation that's becoming uniform and consistent and predictable, it's pretty much just improving them by the subtleties that show up, the little variations. At that point, you're pretty much just trying to maintain them, okay? You're calling out anything that kind of sneaks through that isn't right, bringing to the standouts and improving them. Genetics becomes even more important when you're crossing them because of all the contrasting characteristics that exist. And you got to be able to pick them out. You got to be able to identify them. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's what the Breers Academy does too. We have programs and courses that teach you confirmation of body, defects, disqualifications. It teaches you the structure of the bird, the color of the bird, all the things you need to be selecting for, all the different selection points so that when you're going to buy birds, you're actually getting the right birds. You're actually picking the right birds as your seed fowl so that you can actually move forward instead of picking birds that have so many genetic diversity that you can't move forward because it just takes too much too long to weed through them. And if you're picking the wrong mate, it even makes it harder. If you're using crossing in a wrong way, wouldn't you say that crossing is more of a dead-end method? It's not a long-term breeding method anyway. But if that's all you're doing is crossbreeding, it's a dead-end method. It should be. Not only is it, it should be. Because like I said, whenever you're crossing birds, the cross is for a specific reason to produce something that's a better performer or a better producer, something that's better than the parents. Because it's a one-time deal and it, it's not inheritable, it should be a dead end. It should not be a long-term breeding method. The offspring have one job, to perform the particular task at which they were bred for. When we're doing crossing, all we're looking for is to produce offspring that can overperform or outperform their parents. That's the whole idea. You want something that's better than their parents. And you, you want will, a hybrid. Yeah, a hybrid cross. And you will get that from a good hybrid cross. You will get that from the right parents that are both good foundations. If you're crossing them, you're going to get good hybrid vigor. But you're not going to get that from mongrels. So when you cross mongrels, you have two birds that are mongrels and you cross them together. You're not going to get the hybrid vigor. You're just going to get a lot of genetic diversity, which means you're going to get some that are good, some that are kind of okay, a lot of them that are really bad. That's the difference. I can tell you one thing, though. If you're dealing with hybrid crosses or you're dealing with mongrels, the one thing everybody thinks they can do, they think it's the end all, is line breeding. Never, this is my advice right here, never line breed to birds that are a product of a cross. Never line breed a bird that is a, from a cross or a mongrel. There's a lot that has to be done. There's some fixation that needs to be done. There's some cleanup that needs to be done. Because what you're doing is whenever you're line breeding, you're cloning a bird. And you don't want to clone a bird with a lot of faults, a lot of genetic diversity. There's some cleaning up that needs to be done before you actually do a line breeding program. So everybody seems to think that line breeding is the beginning, the middle, and the end of all breeding programs. Line breeding has its place, and it's a very important place, but it's not a breeding program. And a lot of people are line breeding birds that sh they shouldn't be line breeding. They're trying to clone birds they shouldn't be cloning. They're trying to skip stages. They don't understand that there's other stages. That's the problem. Because of all the mongolization that's going on, there's a lot of people crossing birds, or they think they're crossing, and they're wondering why they're not successful. It's because of all that mongolization that's going on, not all crosses are going to be successful. Definitely not going to be repeatable. And when you have a successful cross, the success of that cross is determined on whether they nick. 
And the whole thing is that the more dominant traits that they share, the better they nick. And you wouldn't know that if you didn't know anything about genetics. No, this is different. I don't think genetics would help you here. Nicking is a whole different thing. Let's say you have two foundation bloodlines and you cross them. They don't always nick. There's something about the different families, some of the traits they have, the propotency they have or don't have, the traits that they share or don't share, whether one carries more dominant genes, whether one carries more recessive genes. There's a lot of factors, a lot of variables involved there that determine whether they're going to nick or not. So whenever you have two families that do nick, then I suggest you keep breeding them to get the hybrid vigor that you're actually looking for. Yeah, but that proves my point right there. You know, the two birds that you're going to choose, knowing the dynamics, knowing the genetic makeup of each bird and being able to choose, okay, well, I know the dynamic makeup of this bird and its genetics. Now I'm going to choose one over here that will be similar to the one that I've already chosen. So that's where I say genetics comes to play, knowing your genetics. Understand this. This is where the complication goes. I think you're right in, in some ways. But you have to consider this. Whenever you have two foundation lines that are completely different families, carry different genes a whole bit. Right. You have the phenotype, and then you have the genotype. And you don't always know what's in the genotype. You can only go by the phenotype and do the best you can. Now, you could match the phenotypes as best you can, but because you don't understand what the genotype is, you bring them together and you go, wow, these offspring came out terrible. I'm just saying that not all crosses, no matter how good the birds are, nick. I'm going to say that sometimes they fail. That's the problem with crossing is that just because you have a pure family here and you got a, another pure family over there, they may not nick. And because even though you're matching the phenotypes the best you can, you don't always know what the genotype is going to be. Yeah. Those are the hidden genes that you don't, you can't see. Right. Just understand that it's not guaranteed. Even if you're dealing with really prepotent parents and they're really pure, they got a lot of dominant homozygous genes, they're successful in their own right when you cross them together and they don't produce the offspring you thought they would. It's just they didn't match. They just want a good cross. Sometimes that happens. Not all crosses are going to nick. I think it's a luck of the draw whether you get a bird that nicks or not. Because there are hidden recessive genes that you're not going to know are there until you see the offspring and you see what... Another thing about a nick, let's say you're not talking about family. Let's say you have just two birds and you bring them together and everything they produce is awesome. Well, a lot of people depend on those nicks. They depend on having the nick. They finally find a cock and a hen that really produced really good offspring. They depend all on that. They put everything in that. But they got to understand that once the mating has changed, let's say one of them dies or something happens to one of them. And once that mating has changed, the nick is gone. The nick just disappears, and now they're lost. So I try to tell people, don't depend on nicks, even on a pure family. Let's say you find a cock and hen that really produce really good offspring. Don't depend on that nick only, because it's going to fail you someday. You got to think of the whole flock. You got to think of the whole family when you're creating a strain. Now, when you're doing crossing, you have two birds that produce really good offspring and it, they seem to nick because the offspring are really good. That's going to be short-lived too because eventually those, those parents aren't going to keep producing offspring. So just know it's not permanent. Yeah, but can't you back cross? Say the hen dies. You can't mate the father to the daughter and keep the family yeah. going? You can keep them going, but they're not going to produce the offspring they were producing because one of them died, Okay. The nick is the fact that you got one cock and one hen that you bred together, that the, everything they produce is good. Then you better damn well breed them all freaking year to get as many offspring as you can. Okay, but... If they're that good. I'm trying to show you the downside of crossbreeding. Not all crosses make it. Not all nicks last. So create a family. You're actually trying to hug the crossing thing when I'm trying to get... It. I'm trying to actually no. move people away from crossing no. to creating a family because it's more long-term. I'm just saying... It's more predictable. Well, yeah, It's more it, consistent, more uniform, more predictable. <laughs> so get away from the crossing. Get away from depending on nicks. I know, but if you, that's, you start with two birds that nick really well, create a family from it. What is wrong with that? I'm not saying anything's wrong with that. I'm just saying that doesn't guarantee a good family just because... The parents nicked. You're never guaranteed from a good family. You, For, for one, you've okay. got to be a good when you, breeder. When you said you just keep breeding the hell out of them, what I'm seeing and what you should do when you have a nick 
is just keep bringing that mother and father together and all the offspring they produce generation after generation or year after year. Okay, well, that's going to run out eventually. Okay, I'm just saying. You're not really following the Nick thing, are you? I guess I'm not because I'm thinking, no, yes, it does. Because if you're a good they're reader, not, they're you not worried. Keep it okay, going. Shh. they're not worried about family. That's the problem. That's when they get so relied on the Nick. They're not thinking family. They're not thinking about creating a strain. They're only thinking about producing as many offspring from these parents as possible, which is this cock and hen. Okay, where do you go from there? What happens when one of them dies? That Nick dies with it. Okay. Okay. They're just reproducing the same offspring over and over again. Now they're They're selling. not actually moving the family forward. They're not actually creating a strain. They're not actually using them in a proper breeding program. They're just taking one cock in one hand, and they just keep on producing offspring. That's fine, but there's no improvement from that. They're not actually creating a family. They're just creating a lot of offspring from two birds. Okay, so what you're basically saying is if you get two birds that nick, and you breed the heck out of them... Eventually, if you don't make a line from them, if you don't start a strain from that awesome Nick and you keep selling all the birds off, yeah. eventually it's gonna that Nick out. is going to die. That, that Nick is going to run out. And you're going to okay. wonder, and you think you have a family because you have a Nick or may even have two Nicks. I don't know. You have a family and then something happens to them. All of a sudden, you're foul. All of a sudden, go in a different direction. They're not producing the birds they were, and they're going in a completely different direction. All of a sudden, you thought you had a family. Now you don't. I'm just saying, don't rely on Nicks. Don't depend on Nicks. Don't expect every cross to produce really good birds. If you're relying on all your breeding and all, everything you do on being all about crossing, you said it yourself, it's a dead-end zone. There's nowhere to go from there. It's going to end someday. So... Why would you want to play that game? Why would you want to ride that treadmill? Why would you want to be the hamster on that wheel? Why not get away from crossing, quit relying on Nick's, create a family, improve them over time, generation after generation. It's more long lasting. It's more dependable. It's more consistent, more uniform. It's more predictable. I really hate hearing people when it seems like they're depending on Nick's or it's all about crossbreeding or always adding new blood. So they do all this crossbreeding, and they finally find a cock and a hen that produce really good offspring, and that's all they breed. They just keep producing birds off of them. And then when they die, they wonder what happened. Well, because those two nicks, what they're really creating are hybrids. Yeah, most of the time. And you're right. You said it earlier, which you're probably more on the money than you think, was they weren't even keeping those offspring. They're probably selling them. They actually wasted time, number of years. Because they relied on the handful of birds that produced really good birds, but they didn't do anything with it. They didn't move forward with it. They didn't actually make something out of it. They just ran them out. It's like you have one cow, it produces milk. Eventually that cow is going to die and you're not going to have any more milk. Instead, you should have been concentrating on getting more cows, okay? So that you made sure you had milk in the future. Am I making any sense or am I? Yeah, no, but we're talking. I think we're talking about two different things. Well, we might be. We're, we're talking about you have this breed over here and you have that breed over there. They're both American game BB Reds, okay? Okay. But they come from farm A and farm B and you put them together and they nick really well. Yeah. Those produce hybrids. Yeah. Okay. Now you produce those for like three years. You don't keep the line going. You just got the mom and dad working like crazy to get this offspring. And then you sell off that all that offspring. And you're like, man, I'm making all this money on these two birds. And then the dad croaks. Okay. okay? And then all you have is a hen and you have all these hybrids. You can't breed those offspring back to the mother and expect to get the same. another set of hybrids. Let me stop you there. You can breed the offspring back to the mother, but the offspring ain't going to be what they were. Now, can you create a family from that point on? Yeah. Still, yeah. But it would take you time, and you would improve them as they go. Okay. A lot of people think, oh, I had this cock and hen. I bred them together. Everything they produced was good. All I got now is a hen. The cock died. So now I'm going to breed this hen to these other roosters. And he keeps bringing them to different roosters, trying to get the same nick that he had before. And all of a sudden, he can't find it. I guess all I'm trying to say is this. And this is the message. Not all crosses produce good offspring. Not all crosses produce good hybrids. A nick doesn't last forever. Nicks are very short-lived. 
And let's say a cock and hen, they are nicking real well. They're producing offspring every every time. But things happen to them, even if they didn't die. Like the hen all of a sudden gets older. Her eggs are as old as she is. She's not producing the offspring she was. Or the cock all of a sudden is infertile. Things just happen, okay? Or they gain weight and they're not producing like they were. So there's a lot of things. Nicks are very short-lived. A lot of times, nicks only last a year or two. I just don't like seeing people get relying on nicks and expecting every cross to be good. When they could spend that time creating a strain and improving that strain each and every generation to the point they're uniform, consistent, and predictable. And they represent them if they've done it right. Crossbreeding has a place in our breeding process, but you have to be smart on how you use it. If that's all you want to do is cross all the time, that's your prerogative. But that's not what I'm saying. What are you saying then? I'm saying that crossbreeding does have a place, but you've got to be smart with it. By just using crossbreeding as your only method of breeding, you're not going to get the good results that every breeder looks for. It's short-lived. It's short-lived. Yes. Have proper expectations. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> well, it's like... I'm not going to say you can't because this is a free country and you can do whatever the heck you want. But okay, yes, I am going to say you can't say that you are a master breeder and all you do is crossbreed. A master breeder knows when to crossbreed and when not to because it's a method. It's a tool to be used on certain times in certain ways. Okay. And, and I know you guys all know what I'm talking about because we've talked about the proper uses of crossbreeding earlier in this episode. But so that's basically what I've got to say. Okay. Okay. On to the next. Where are we? <laughs> Shoot. Okay. On to the next We're question. Getting into for the you. good stuff. Getting into the good stuff. All right. Why are the offspring unpredictable when crossing or infusing new blood? It's pretty simple actually. There's no fixation or locking in the genes. You're recombinating the genes thereby you're changing the family. That's the biggest thing right there is the recombination of genes. Anytime you add new blood, you completely change the family. You recombinate the genes. They're never going to be the same, okay? And whenever you have a family, there's got to be a certain amount of fixation and locking of the genes, and you don't never want to mess that up by adding new blood. On top of that, meiosis, it's always working against you. Meiosis is responsible for much of our variation. It's responsible for the genetic diversity that we see. And like I said, many times the genes are actually working against you. You're introducing new recessives, you're eliminating important dominants, and you're selecting for the wrong intensities for many of the what we call polygenic traits. You're either intensifying them in the wrong direction or you're, you're eliminating them completely because polygenic traits are interesting. It takes many years to create a polygenic trait. It takes many years to get to an intensity to where you're actually improving them and they're, where they're really good, but bringing to the wrong bird that can disappear overnight. What I'm seeing from most people when they're doing crossbreeding, they're not selectively breeding. It's more random breeding. It's more speculative breeding. We don't see any selection for the traits that really count. Mixing bloods, like I said, all breeding and selection are speculative and nothing but guesses, at best. If you ask me, most of them are actually, they're doing nothing more than experimenting. And none of their breeding is based on science whatsoever. Okay, here's my two cents of a not-so-sensible analogy. Take an egg. For two cents, um, that's all I'm going to get? <laughs> you take an egg, you crack it open, you put it in a bowl. You take another egg, you crack it open, you put it in the same bowl. You get a fork, and you mix it all up. What do you got? <laughs> scrambled genes all over the place. And your point is? You got scrambled genes all over the place. Okay. I see breakfast. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're basically, rec you know, that's simple as it gets. Really think about this. Think hard about this. You have a family. We're talking about mostly infusion here. You have a family. We've crossed over to infusion. No, we're just, let's just, well, to me, that's all we've ever been talking about. We're talking about crossing and infusion. To me, they're same things, different purposes, okay? So let's talk about infusion. So you think your family has some faults in some areas, and you think they really need improvement. They're going in the wrong direction. You think you've inbred them too much. That's a big one. People think they've inbred them, which actually takes a lot longer, a lot more to get them inbred or reach inbreeding depression than they think. But they think all of a sudden the faults that they're seeing is because they're inbred. So they bring in new blood. And some of these people think they've had this blood for years and just think this one little blood is going to improve on them. 
Well, they totally took the genes and recombinated them and changed them completely to something else. Now the family is not the family it once was. It's completely changed. And the best way to, to really examine this for what it really is is to look into meiosis to get a better understanding of meiosis. Oh, now we're really getting serious. This is where the mud hits the road or something like that. <laughs> the, <laughs> tire, I said. the tires now, hit the road. Now we're really getting now serious. Now we're in the mud. Now we're in the mud. Okay, so tell me about meiosis. Crossbreeding and meiosis. Let's take the idea of recombinating genes to the next level. Okay. Scrambling my two eggs together. So let me back up a little bit. So whenever you're crossing, you're causing a recombination of the genes. This interferes with gene frequency, interfering on how often the specific traits are expressed. So the traits that you counted on, they always express themselves. All of a sudden, they don't. Things have changed. Now you're seeing things pop up that you weren't seeing before. Now we're increasing genetic diversity. In reality, this is a breeder's enemy. Whenever you have a family, the last thing you want is a lot of genetic diversity. By infusing that blood, you've introduced many unknown and hidden genes. You've introduced unknown and unwanted recessives, which can never be eliminated. You've increased the unpredictability of traits and the behavior of the offspring. So basically, you've increased variability within the family. And this happens both in phenotype and genotype. So let's take a closer look at meiosis and why this is important. And this is what I'd like to call meiosis in the crossover event. And this is where we have the creation of gametes, which is the sperm and the egg. We have the sperm cells and the egg cells. Let's take a quick look at meiosis. So you have meiosis one. You have the interphase, which is the G1 stage, the S stage, and the G2 stage, which is responsible for the cell growing and the creation of the DNA. During prophase one, the chromosomes are formed. You have synapsis, which leads us to the crossover event, the exchanging of genes. This is where we're getting our genetic diversity, which also creates the variation in the population. So it's because of meiosis and the crossover event, the way the chromosomes are actually wrapping around each other, they separate, leaving chunks of each other apart. Then they divide into two, divide into four, which gives us four separate gametes. This is where we're getting all that genetic diversity and all the variation. So every time you add new blood through meiosis, we're creating more variation, more genetic diversity in the family, and this is where the recombinating of the genes occurs. Why is this important? Whenever you cross or infuse, you are recombinating the genes, creating more genetic diversity. The more unrelated the parents are, the greater the variation. So whenever you're crossing birds, you're basically ruining the family. So if you have an established family and you're infusing new blood, you're completely changing them. They're ne never going to be the birds they once were. Now, this could be a good thing or a bad thing, but every time you add new blood, whether it's every year or every five or six years, that family is completely different than what they were. And I've seen so many people create a family to get 15, 16, or 7, 8s. They actually got the family going in a really good direction, doing good. All of a sudden, they get scared, and they think they've inbred too close. So they think they need to refresh in the blood, so they add new blood. Again, they recombinate the genes, they change the family completely, and they messed up everything they did, and they're basically starting over from scratch instead of just keep on going. Let's rehash this. Crossbreeding and meiosis and the recombination of genes. When you're crossing or infusing, you are causing a recombination of genes. You are interfering with the gene frequency, thereby interfering with how often the specific traits are expressed. You are increasing genetic diversity, thereby creating more variation. The end result introducing many unknown or hidden genes, introducing many unknown or unwanted recessives, which can never be eliminated, increasing the unpredictability of traits and behaviors in the offspring and the strain, and increasing variability in both phenotypes and genotypes. Perfect. She was paying attention. There you go. <laughs> I got it. What are some of the actions that meiosis is responsible for? Meiosis is simple, and it's actually brilliant the way it works. Because if you had two chromosomes from the mother and the father, and they were just past the offspring, some of our offspring would be only you. They'd be almost like clones of you and would be clones of me. But because they wrap together 
And when they split apart and they actually leave parts of each other, that creates the variation. That's why all our offspring, even our daughters, they all look different from each other and they look different from us. So you want that to a sense. You want some genetic diversity. You do want some variation. But when you have a uniform and consistent family, that variation is low. That variation is important, but when you have a pure family, you want to lessen the variation. You want to lessen the genetic diversity as much as possible so you get that uniformity and that consistency. That's important. But the problem is when you're adding new blood or you're infusing new blood, you are changing that family completely. You are recombinating the genes to become a different family than they were before. They're basically all different. Not only are they different from what they were before, but almost every bird is different from each other. Okay, you just contradicted yourself. What? Because you said the variation is important, and then you said that Some it's vari- not important. Okay, you're right. I'm glad you said that. Now, you want to lessen the variation in the genetic diversity as much as possible to get a nice, uniform, and consistent family. Okay, but some variation in some genetic diversity is important. Or not say, I'm not going to say genetic diversity. I'm going to say variation. Some variation is important because there's an old saying that I've lived by. Variation makes selection possible and selection makes improvement possible. I can't improve even a, a well-bred family. I'd like to see a little variation here and there so I can keep on improving. It's like my Maximus line. Now, they're pretty uniform. They're really consistent. They're really nice birds. But I'm still able to improve them, which is amazing that I am, but I'm still able to improve them because I still every now and then see a little variation, a little something that pops up from time to time. I either cull it or I select for it and I improve them from there. So you do want some variation because that's the only way you're going to improve your fowl. But we don't want the kind of variation or the genetic diversity that we're going to get by adding new blood or infusing new blood because that's huge. One bird in, introduced into a family can change the family completely. Like I said, we're recombinating the genes. And meiosis explains why that happens. Got it. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Okay. It's not just luck of the draw. Well, it kind of is. When you think of the blood that's being added to the family and the way it's dispersed throughout the family after that, it's a scary thing. And again, because you're introducing many different genes, some hidden genes, unwanted genes, recessive genes, sometimes even lethal genes, you don't know what you're putting into that family. I've seen many strains ruined by outcrossing or the infusion of blood instead of just staying the course. Maybe creating a subline and then working on the faults that happen to exist. So this basically leads us to how many think that they, by crossbreeding, they can improve or fix a trait. And it's usually considered the compensation of characteristics. And some people even call it the blanket effect. So they think by taking a bird that has either some strengths or some faults and bring it to another bird that has strengths and faults, but they're different from the other bird, that by putting them together they fix each other. It's like having two blankets, both blankets having holes in them, but because you lie them over each other, you're hoping that those holes are covered up by the other blanket. Thereby, it fixes itself. Well, it doesn't work like that. You're just introducing genes. A lot of times, you're introducing genes that you don't want. We were talking about the second ago. You're introducing a lot of times. You're either eliminating some of the dominant genes, you're introducing recessive genes, or you're introducing lethal genes. The dominant genes are what you want, especially the homozygous dominant genes, the pure ones. The recessive genes rarely are the ones you want that you don't already have, and then the lethal genes will destroy your strain for sure. So this idea of this blanket effect, this blanket theory, the compensation of characteristics, is actually something that will actually work against you rather than for you. I think it gets more people in trouble, and I think that's why they believe that they can infuse new blood. They think that by infusing the new blood in a family that's starting to show faults, we'll fix them. And actually, I think they're making things worse. In some ways, if we're creating a family and we want to take advantage of crossbreeding, we could benefit a lot by maybe following the way some of the commercial breeders operate their breeding programs and their purebred families. What they have, and this is kind of the way I do it too, is they have their grandparent lines, which is their primary breeders. These are their pure lines. Okay, these are highly guarded lines, very protected. Nobody gets them. Okay, then you have your grandparent lines, which are the primary breeders. They're pure, unrelated birds bred for creating two way crosses. So, if you want to take advantage, you have your great grandparent lines, you take the offspring from that. We're talking about two different grandparent lines. 
Okay, you take the offspring from that, you cross them together for a two-way cross. This produces their parent lines. And this is what we see like at the hatchery, production lines, hybrid crosses to produce birds for the consumer. Okay, then we have the consumer birds, and they're pretty much getting whatever those things produce. So if we want to protect our lines, we want to keep our lines to ourselves, which a lot of people do, then we create those grandparent lines, which are our pure lines. Then we sell the rest. Now, this can be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on who's using it and for what purpose. And we call this recumbent reciprocal selection. Here's my deal. If they're using it for the right reasons and they're honest to the people who are buying them, then I have no problem with that. But if they're taking these grandparent lines and then they're crossing them together and selling the offspring from that and then calling them pure, then I have a big problem. And it's one of the reasons why I call it, or I'm always asking, is it true breeding or is it the big con? And like I said, it depends on who's using it and for the purpose for which they're using it and how honest they are with the birds that they're selling. Are you talking about, okay, we're talking about commercial breeders. Are you talking about, say, the Cornish Cross? Some of the egg producers that are out there? Oh, like the hybrids, the what, the what red you're star? Seeing, well, those are actually sex-linked a lot of times. That's even further into the rabbit hole when you think about it. But I'm talking about the egg producers who have like really pure leg horns and they have whatever they're breeding them to, okay, to produce the birds that we're seeing at the egg farms. They're getting that hybrid vigor. In that case, the consumer is these farms. They're getting the, their birds from those who raise the pure birds, which are the great-grandparent lines. Okay, hatcheries too. Whatever birds that they're producing, whether it's the Cornish crosses or other breeds, they're getting their birds from other people who have those grandparent lines. They're crossing them to get the grandparent lines, and then the hatcheries get the parent lines. And then we get the offspring from that. So it's no wonder that we're not able to reproduce those great birds from the hatchery birds. We're just getting something that kind of looks like those birds. Who knows what's really in them? I don't have a problem with that as long as who's ever doing that is honest about what they're producing and what they're selling. If they're still calling them pure birds, then I have a problem with it. So that's why I call it the big con, because a lot of people aren't using it for the right reasons. They're not honest about what they're doing. I've been anxiously waiting to hear about this one. Tell me about the muddy water theory. Because it's really interesting. Well, this kind of goes back into the infusion of new blood, adding new blood to your family, thinking you can breathe in and breathe it back out again. And I like to think of this as the glass of muddy water. So you have a glass of muddy water. You start pouring clean water into it until it becomes clear again. And this is the same thing as like, let's say I have a family, a fowl. I think they need improvement. So I take a bird from someone else's farm. I breed it into mine. So I get the offspring and I keep breeding my birds back <laughs> it must be because I'm getting tired. But you're explaining this. You've got a glass of muddy water, and then you pour some clean water, and you get it clean. And I'm thinking about my two eggs <laughs> that I mix together, and then I'm putting it in a pan, and I'm just cooking them. And then there you go. Voila, I've changed it. So, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> you're getting goofy. Oh, my God. <clears throat> I guess this is what happens when I make her work past her... Well, well, I came home from work. I haven't eaten dinner. It's nine o'clock. We've been at this for three hours. <laughs> but I think my analogy about the two eggs is probably not the no, same. No, it's as not. The muddy I don't even water. think it's close. <laughs> okay, so I want to make sure everybody's on track here. Okay, sorry about get that. Get past that part. Okay. So, okay, try to imagine. I'm going to try to use the analogy, but I'm going to try to cross it a little bit so that you understand how this relates to the way people are infusing blood and what's happening, what the consequences are. So I look at the muddy water. Let's say you have a glass of muddy water. The muddy water is representative of the offspring that was produced when you infuse new blood. I had a foundation line. I got a bird from somebody else I thought was really good, and I added it to mine. Okay, now what that created was a glass of muddy water because I recombinated the genes. I've got a lot of variation in there, a lot of genetic diversity. Basically, it's the product of a cross. So I have the influence of both parents. My fowl, which is the foundation, the bird I use as the infusion, and they represent the muddy water. Okay, so I start breeding the offspring back to my foundation line, which is considered the clean water. So I keep pouring that clean water into the muddy water until eventually it becomes what looks like a clear glass of water. So basically, I just kept breeding my birds 
into the fowl that had the infusion to the point where they seem to be what they used to be. But if I were to take a microscope and I were to take a drop of that water, put it in the microscope, even though I didn't see it in the glass of water, I would see the influence of that cross. I would see the influence of that muddy water, the particles in it, in that drop under a microscope. Well, that's the same thing that's happening in your family. You never actually breed out the genes that you added. When you did that infusion, the results or the influence of that infusion stay with that family forever. You'll never get it out completely. What's left in there, a lot of times you've eliminated some of the dominant traits, especially the homozygous dominant traits, which you really want it to keep to create prepotency. You've added recessives that will never leave. And you might have even added some lethal genes that you didn't want. So whenever I think of infusion, I think people saying I've got a pure family and I infuse new blood to either refresh in them or help improve them. And I think of that muddy water, that the, the influence from that infusion is in that family forever and they'll never get it out. And this could be a good thing or a bad thing. A lot of times it ends up being a bad thing. But it, that family will never be what it was at one time. Yeah. So the bad thing is you mess up a good family or the good thing is you improve a bad family. Which you could have, um, a lot of times you can improve them. A lot of times they're thinking that they're getting too inbred. It's only their fear. And a lot of times they're not seeing evidence of that inbreeding that they think they've done. They're not seeing evidence of that family getting too close. They're just fear that they're getting there. So then they add new blood and change everything, which I think should be even scarier if you ask me. That's pretty much all I want to talk about today. (laughs) I think we covered everything pretty good. Did I leave anything out? Let me see. I do hope this gives people a a better understanding, maybe a respect, maybe a a clearer idea what the results are going to be when they do a cross and the consequences that they're going to run into. I mean, if that's what they're doing, they're crossing for a specific reason. That's one thing. But if they're crossing or add new blood indiscriminately or thinking that an infusion is going to fix their family, I hope they reconsider because I think there's, well, I know there is. There's a better way to go. I don't think they realize the consequences. So I'm hoping this episode really helps them in that area. Yeah, I hope it's sunk in. I seriously do. And I don't mean to be arrogant about it, but I would really like to see people create more strains and keep them pure. Yeah. From the material that we covered here, I know there's going to be a member's version and a non-member's version. There's some material on the outline that we actually did not cover, but it will be in the show notes. So for my members, uh, when you check it out and you go into the website to either uh, listen to this or read the show notes, check that out. I would say there's about a good quarter of the material we didn't cover, maybe more. And so you'll be able to read that inside the show notes. Yes, but unfortunately, you won't be able to read on the the analogy that I had with the two eggs in the bowl. (laughs) That That was off the cuff. That's not in the, that is definitely not in the show notes. That was special. (laughs) That was was just special from me to you, the listeners. And uh, we all really appreciate you all being here and listening to us gab about crossbreeding and infusion. Which is actually not my favorite subject. It's probably the one I least want to do. Although I get excited about it in that the information I want you to take from this most would be whenever you cross and I I know we harped on it we said it over and over again and we even had a major section on it is that when you're adding new blood you're recombinating the genes and really understand what meiosis does the function of meiosis and how that works against you getting the results that you think you're going to get meiosis plays a huge factor that crossover event which creates variation which creates genetic diversity, which recombinate the genes. When you think of that, why are you doing the crossing in the first place? What is it about the crossing or actually the infusion of blood into an established foundation? What do you think you're accomplishing? It's working against you. You basically shot yourself in the foot. You changed that family forever. And I'm hoping that's what you take from this. So in other words, don't do it. Never infuse new blood. They can always be fixed. And we can teach you how to do that in the Breeders Academy using the Founders Program. Okay, thanks for listening. Yes, thank you again for joining us on the Bread to Perfection podcast show. 
This show was brought to you by the Breeders Academy, where by becoming a member, you can increase your knowledge of breeding, advance your skills as a breeder, and take you and your fowl to the next level. We can also show you how to create a strain from hybrid crosses or mongrel flocks and help you to create, maintain, and improve your present strains. We urge you to check it out. You have nothing to lose and you can cancel anytime. To join us at the Breeders Academy membership website, go to www.breedersacademy.com. Best of all, I'll be there to help you every step of the way. While you're checking out the Breeders Academy, make sure to sign up for our newsletter, The Breeders Bulletin. We provide a lot of free bonus materials and some great information that will take you and your fowl to the next level. Well, that's it for now. We hope you join us next time for another episode of Bread to Perfection. We'll see you later. Bye. Bye.